Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the St. Jude's Christmas Eve service. What a strange year it has been that has led to us not being able to gather together on this night in person to sing the carols that we love to sing, to light candles together, to break bread together, and to hear the story and to celebrate the story of Christ's birth. But even though we're not able to gather together in body, we know that we are together in spirit. I would like to thank Christina Willett for all the hard work that she has done to be able to uh, bring all the different people who have offered music as part of this service together and to make it possible. I encourage you to use this resource in your home and to sing along to the carols, to pray along with the prayers, and to use this in this, uh, un, un, this uncertain time, to use this resource to allow you to be able to worship on this night that God loves us enough to come to us in the birth of Christ. Let us pray. <laughs>
Dear friends in Christ, in this Christmas season, let it be our duty and our delight to hear once more the message of the angels, to go to Bethlehem and to see the Son of God lying in a manger. But first, let us pray for the needs of the whole world. Let us pray for peace and justice on earth. Let us pray for the mission and the unity of the church for which Christ died. And because he particularly loved them, let us remember in prayer, let us remember in his name, the poor and the helpless, those who are cold this night, those who are going hungry, those who are oppressed. Let us pray for those who are sick and for those who care for them. Let us pray for those who mourn, particularly in this year of living through the COVID pandemic. Let us pray for all those who have died as a result of the coronavirus and for all those who grieve. Let us pray for all those who are aged, again, particularly those who are living in long-term care, those who are vulnerable or alone. Let us pray for all God's children. And to sum up these petitions, let us pray the prayer that Christ our Savior has taught us, as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea." On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord.
In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for who, for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. 
When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared and in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. The word of the Lord. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their towns to be registered. Joseph also went to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. The word of the Lord.
In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. The word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his sorrow at the rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For you shall come a ruler who is the shepherd, my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called to the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me work word, so that I may also go pay him homage. 
When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star, and they had seen as it was rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, 
the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I pray that I might speak to you tonight in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm pretty sure that we've all heard the sentiment expressed around this time of year that we need to keep Christ in Christmas. My usual response is that if we truly want to keep Christ in Christmas, then feed the hungry, clothe the naked, forgive the guilty, welcome the unwanted, care for the sick. That's how to keep Christ in Christmas. The same way that you keep Christ in Christian. But when people say that, that we need to keep Christ in Christmas, what I think they are really responding to is the fact that our secular holiday traditions often leave out altogether the birth of the one, the birth of the one we celebrate tonight, in favor of a jolly old fat man with a red suit and his trusty sidekick reindeer with the shiny nose. In our culture, we prefer our Christmas to be warm and fuzzy with a side of nostalgia. We want the hallmark version of Christmas. We long for Christmas to be just like the idyllic scenes found on the front of countless Christmas cards. Our culture loves a sentimental Christmas. And that sentimentality, that desire for things to be warm and fuzzy around this time of year, that has slowly been creeping into how it is that we hear and how we tell and even how we draw meaning from the story of Jesus' birth. As Nadia Bolt Weber puts it, how did Christmas go from what it was originally? How did it go from a story of alienation, a story of political tyranny, a story of homelessness, a story that focuses on working class people, pagans and angels? How did it go from all of that to a Hallmark Channel Precious Moments Norman Rockwell delusion? Just think of all of those Christmas pageants we love so much. We smile at the warm and cozy nativity scene. But have you ever spent a night in a barn? Or have you ever given birth in a barn? The reality is so very different. Cold, smelly, completely unsanitary, no place for anyone to ever give birth. But thinking about that reality makes us uncomfortable. And so over the years, we have cleaned up the stable. We have given it a soft, warm glow because nobody wants to think about that other stuff around Christmas time. We want to keep things light. But let me also ask you, why is it that Mary had to give birth to Jesus in that barn? We know the story, right? Because it's because there was no place for them in the inn. Everyone is, was in town for the census. But what we don't very often stop and think about is that if it is true that everyone had to go to their own hometown in order to be registered. Doesn't that mean that Joseph would have had family still living in Bethlehem? And I don't know about you, but if my son was in town with his nine-month pregnant girlfriend, side note, that better not happen anytime soon, but if it did, if my son showed up in town with his nine-month pregnant girlfriend, 
You better believe that I would find room in the house for them to stay, rather than letting them stay in a barn. But again, we, we tend to prefer the romanticized PG version of this story, rather than the reality. And the reality is this. Most scholars believe that Mary and Joseph were forced to take the barn for no other reason than that their family had utterly rejected them. They were being shunned by their family. Because how dare Joseph show up on their doorsteps with his pregnant girlfriend and embarrass them. No, disgrace them. Disgrace the family like that. And then there's Herod. I think we all get the sense from the story about the wise men. I think we all get the sense that Herod wasn't really a good guy in this story. But do we really truly know just how evil Herod was? Probably not. Because nowhere does Herod ever appear. Nowhere does Herod appear in our mantle adorning crest scenes. And never in a million years would you see included in a children's Christmas pageant the part of the story where no sooner had the wise men decked out in their bathrobes, no sooner had they left the stable after presenting their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh to baby Jesus, no sooner than all of that had happened, that King Herod plots to put Jesus to death. In fact, Herod is so determined to stop Jesus that he sends troops, he sends out the army to slaughter all of the infants of Bethlehem on the off chance that one of them might be Jesus. We have a day in the church year where we remember this story. It's called the Holy Innocents because so many innocent young children were killed because of King Herod. But that part of the story never makes it into the Christmas pageants that we love so much. Because again, we prefer our Christmas to be warm and fuzzy. We really do want the Hallmark movie version we long for Christmas to be just like the idyllic scenes found on the front of countless Christmas cards. Our culture loves a sentimental Christmas. But I got to tell you, after the kind of year that we have just lived through, I think it is time for us to consider putting Herod back in Christmas. Because a sentimental Christmas doesn't really have all that much to offer to our lives. A sentimental Christmas has nothing life-giving or substantial to offer in a world where 22 people in Nova Scotia get killed by a mass shooter driving around in a fake police car. A warm and fuzzy kind of Christmas has nothing to offer in the midst of a pandemic where at the time of writing this sermon, 1,650,000 people have died from the coronavirus. A hallmark Christmas has nothing to offer a world where 400, student, where 400 students can be kidnapped just so that some terrorist group can get a ransom. Where 400 children are kidnapped from their classroom. Or in a world where George Floyd lies on the ground with a police officer's knee on his neck for eight minutes, with George crying out, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. In a world where there is so much violence. In a world where there is so much hate and racism. A sentimental, warm and fuzzy Christmas offers little hope. It offers very little light into the things that each one of us in our own lives are wrestling with at this very moment. We may be used to hearing people say, keep Christ in Christmas. But in a year like the one that we have just lived through, I think we need to be trying to keep Herod in Christmas. 
Because again, as Nadia says, the story of Christmas, the story of Christmas is about, is as much about comfort and joy as it is about how messed up our world really is. Our God, our God did not enter the hallmark version of a world that we like to pretend is reality. God did not enter the picture-perfect Christmas card world we paint of silent night and snow gently falling and peace on earth sentimentality. God came to us. God was born into a world, the kind of world that was as violent and disturbing and completely messed up as our own world is today. One of the Christmas carols that we love to sing, Away in the Manger, has a line in it that says about Jesus, no crying he makes. Here's what Carol Wallace, an Anglican priest, had to say about that carol, particularly that line of the carol. She said that my guess, my guess is that Jesus cried a lot. We know from the Gospels that the more that Jesus saw of the world in which he was born into, the more he saw of the world in which he lived, the more he mourned the more he wept regularly. A Jesus who doesn't weep with those who weep, a Jesus who is just sentimental myth, that may be the one that our culture prefers, but that Jesus can do nothing for us. Trapping Jesus in the soft glow of a romanticized stable will always leave us struggling. It will always leave us searching in our lives. Where do we find Jesus? Where do we find God when life gets tough? Where do we find God in the midst of the horrible tragedies that continue to happen around the world and in our own lives? A sentimental Christmas, a sentimental Jesus, will always leave us, will always leave us searching for where we find God. But when we choose to acknowledge that the story of Herod, when we choose to acknowledge that the story of the holy innocence, when we choose to acknowledge that those are as much a part of the Christmas story as are the shepherds and the angels, that is the moment when we open ourselves up to discovering and experiencing real and genuine meaning in this story for our broken world, for our hurting lives, for our messed up world. I love that tonight we ended with John's Gospel because those are the words that always put the Christmas story in perspective for me. Particularly when John says that a light the one true light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. God freely chose to enter our world. He chose to freely enter our world as violent and messed up as it is, in order to be a light shining in the darkness. God loves all of us. God loves all of humanity so much that he chose to come and be present with us in the pain, to be there with us in the sorrow, in the suffering, in the tragedies. And that light, the light of Christ's love, cannot and will not be overcome by the darkness. Not by Herod. Not by Gabriel Wortman. Not by a racist police officer not by any pandemic. The light of Christ will always shine bright in the darkness of our world. So tonight, let's put Herod back in Christmas and let us rejoice because God loves us enough to come to us as we are, as things are, 
in order to be a light that shines in the darkness. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, this night is radiant with the brilliance of your one true light. As we have known the revelation of that light on earth, bring us to see the splendor of your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and in the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you.